Welcome to this video. Today we are going to talk about conformal maps. The basic idea for conformal maps is that you have two open sets inside of the complex plane and you're wondering is there, does there exist a function that is holomorphic and bijective? Um, and so some other words you can use are is there a biholomorphism or is there a conformal map or is there a holomorphic bijective function. Those are all equivalent ways of talking about the same function f. And turns out if there does exist a conformal map, then likewise there exists an inverse where the inverse goes from v to u and is also holomorphic. So that's a really cool um, thing about conformal maps. There are some cool properties which arise when v specifically is the unit disk. And so really what our uh, question comes down to is what properties of u need to be in place for u to have a conformal map to d? And turns out all that needs to happen is u needs to be simply connected. Now we're going to talk about and prove one of a, the most important um, concepts of conformal maps, which is the conformal map between the half upper half plane in the complex plane and the unit disk. And um, if we can understand this proof, then um, a lot of things follow pretty easily. So here we have the upper half disk and the upper half plane and the unit disk, and then function f maps h to d and function g maps d to h, and they're written below. So in order to prove that um, these map uh, our conformal maps, we just need to show four things. The first thing is we need to show that every point in H is mapped to D by F. So F maps every point in H to D. Similarly, we need to show that G maps every point in D to H. And then the other things we need to show um, is that the composition of F and G lead to W and the composition of G and F lead to Z. So what I'm saying is if I have a point W inside of D and we map it by G to a point in H, then I can um, map it back to that exact same point in D. Okay, so we'll start with the first thing that F maps H to D. So we're gonna start with any point inside of H so let z equal or let z be an element of h and if that's true then it must be true that z is closer to i than it is to negative i and if i just draw a picture you can see that every single point inside h must be closer to i than negative i which means that the distance from z to i is less than the distance from z to negative i and i'm just manipulating this a little bit so that we can um put it in terms of the function and you'll see that in a second. So here I divide both sides by i plus z and then I end up with that function is less than one. And so if I let w equal to f of z then the modulus of w is less than one which is the same definition that w is in d. So we have now just shown that uh, z map or f maps h to d. Similarly we're going to do the same for g. Now we start with a point inside d and all I want to show is that the um, imaginary part of g of w is greater than zero because that's uh, what a point in h looks like. The imaginary part is positive. So I'm going to let w be in the disk and I'm going to break w down into the real and imaginary parts. And so here I'm just uh, filling in what g is equal to. Okay, and so this is the tricky part. Uh, the ima imaginary part of i times something is equal to the real part of that something. And I'm just having a little side example to show that to you to convince yourself if that doesn't make sense. Um, so pause the video and make sure that makes sense and then we'll move on. So then here I'm plugging in uh, the value for w, so that's u and iv, and then this part is now, the rest of this is just algebra that is a little bit annoying, but essentially I'm multiplying the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator and um, continuing this out until I end up with just strictly the real part of g of w. So what you're noticing here is that I'm using the fact that we have a difference of squares and um, keeping that in mind it makes the calculations a little bit simpler. So 
So notice that the only imaginary part is just that 2iv in the numerator, so I can take that out and the rest is all real, so I can get rid of my um, quantifier of the real part. Okay, so now notice this u squared plus v squared is less than 1, and the reason I know that that's less than 1 is because I know that w has to be bounded by 1 since it's a unit disk, and the modulus is defined as the real and the imaginary part squared. So since that has to be less than 1, then likewise that whole thing must be greater than 0, which is what we wanted to show. Okay, so for the third and fourth part, this part's really simple. You're just plugging in definitions and simplifying until you end up with the answer you want. So here, um, again, I'm just showing that the composition leads back to the exact same starting point. So here I'm just plugging in the definition. I'm multiplying top and bottom by i to make things a little bit simpler, and you will see that it beautifully works out so that we end up with the answer we want. Now that we've shown these four things, we are done with the proof, and if you want to follow along, this proof is in the book, and I pretty much copied it exactly, so that is where you can reference it. Thank you for watching!